I don't think everyone realizes that dermatologists are not just trained in skin disorders, but we are also trained in disorders of hair and nails. And so I thought for today's video, I would focus on facts about hair that are either interesting or important or both. So if you wanna know more about hair, watch this. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis and I'm a board certified dermatologist. I'm here to help you understand your skin and your hair and find products that work for you. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up. Fact one, your hair is dead. It is not a living thing. Once it leaves the surface of your skin and you can visibly see it growing out of your head, everything you're seeing is dead. It's dead skin cells and it is protein. So when we're talking about the health of your hair, it's really more talking about how well has your dead hair been preserved since it exited your scalp follicles. The reason I wanted to bring up this point is because anything you do to the ends of your hair or anything that you do that does not directly involve your scalp is not going to make your hair grow more or make your hair grow faster. So for example, trimming your hair regularly is not going to make your hair grow any faster or shaving your head is not going to make hair grow in thicker. That being said, trimming your hair regularly can help your hair grow longer if your hair growth has been stunted by breakage. So oftentimes as the hair comes down out of the scalp, obviously the hair that's down at the bottoms here is less healthy than the hair coming out of the scalp because it's been exposed to the elements for much longer and it is therefore more prone to breakage. So if you remove the most damaged portions of the hair, the broken ends, it might have the opportunity to grow longer before that breakage kind of takes over and stunts the hair growth again, but it does not affect how the hair grows out at the roots. Speaking of hair health, I kind of want to touch on hair anatomy a little bit and talk about the cuticle because it's the thing that comes up in hair commercials or hair advertisements a lot. And people are always asking me like, well, what, what is the hair cuticle? So the hair cuticle is the outermost layer of cells of your hair. You can sort of think of it like the bark on a tree and it really serves a protective purpose. And because the cuticle is like the armor of your hair, it is the most susceptible to being damaged. And once the cuticle is damaged, the armor of your hair is not intact anymore. And then the inner layers of your hair, the part of your hair that gives it strength is susceptible to damage too. So a healthy intact cuticle is really the key to maintaining healthy hair. When you're envisioning the cuticle, think of it as flat overlapping cell layers, kind of like shingles on a roof. And when the cuticle is flat like that, the hair will feel smooth and look shiny. However, if those cell layers start to lift up, which can happen with a damaged cuticle, then the hair will feel rough and look dull. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, a lot of common hair care practices cause the cuticle to lift up, especially if the hair has been damaged repeatedly over time. So things like friction from shampooing or combing or brushing your hair can lift the cuticle. UV damage can lift your cuticle. Heat styling can lift the cuticle of the hair. So it's always important to minimize those things as much as possible. But of course, like you have to live your life. You want your hair to look good. So it's always going to be a balance. This is also where certain conditioners or hair serums or hair oils can come into play because they can help temper temporarily flatten the cuticle down to make the hair look shinier and healthier. So with all of that knowledge about the hair cuticle, I hope you can understand that cells on the hair cuticle lift and lower, but they do not open and close. And hot water does not cause the cuticle to lift versus cold water causing the cuticle to close. Actually, any type of wetness to the hair will lift the cuticle no matter what. It does not matter the temperature. Cold water does not seal your hair cuticle down. And if I see that in one more commercial or Instagram post, I'll lose my mind. The next thing that I think is really important to know about hair is that it's constantly cycling through a growth phase, a rest phase, and a shedding phase. And that each hair on your body is actually at a different point in that journey at one time. So it's not like all of your hair is growing and then all of it's resting and then all of it's shedding. That's what happens with some mammals and that's why they lose all of their hair at once during certain times of the year. But in humans, we have different hairs doing different things at different times. The growth phase of your hair is called an and usually about 85 to 90% of your hairs are in that growth phase at any point in time. Anagen phase typically lasts anywhere from two to six years, but in some people will be shorter and some people will be longer. So usually you can think of somebody in your life who is able to grow their hair really, really long, like longer than most people you know. And that's because the anagen phase of their hair is much longer. It might be seven years or eight years or 10 years, meaning that their hair continues to grow for 10 years before shedding, which is much longer 
longer than average. And if you're looking at yourself going, why does my hair never grow longer than this? You have to think, okay, is it because my hair is breaking on the ends or do I just have an antigen phase that stops after a certain point and when my hair gets to a certain length, it sheds. Only about 1% of your hairs are in the catagen phase or in the shedding phase. And during that phase, the hair basically starts to kind of die off at the root and then fall out. And that process from start to finish takes about two to three weeks. But again, it's only a very small percentage of your hairs actually shedding at one time. And then about 10 to 15% of your hairs are in the telogen phase or the resting phase. And that typically lasts about three months. So your hair is growing and it's resting in the telogen phase for a few months and then it goes into the shedding phase and then it falls out. And that process starts all over again. I'll just take this moment to briefly digress and discuss a phenomenon called telogen telogen effluvium. This happens when there is any type of intense metabolic stress to the body. So for example, childbirth that sends a lot of your hairs prematurely into the telogen or into the rest phase. So normally you might only have 10 to 15% of your hairs in a telogen or rest phase and that abnormal stress can cause 20, 25% of your hairs to go into a rest phase at once which means that all of those hairs are going to shed at the exact same time a few months later. And that can be incredibly alarming and it's why women after they have a child will often have this increase in hair loss that happens a few months later. Speaking of hair loss and hair shedding, it is totally normal to lose somewhere between 50 and 200 hairs per day. And that might vary based on the season and it also might vary based on other factors in your life, like what medications you've been taking, what environmental stressors you've been experiencing, Experiencing and what your genetic makeup is. I think a lot of people get the incorrect impression that washing your hair more frequently will make your hair fall out more because when they're in the shower, that's when they notice the most amount of hair shedding. When you're manipulating your hair in the shower, some of those hairs that maybe you shed two or three days ago were kind of trapped among your tresses. And then as you ran your fingers through or got the hair wet, all of that hair was released. So you might be noticing one or two or three days of hair loss in a single showering session, but that doesn't mean that washing your hair is the thing that's making your hair fall out. This next hair fact is really just interesting more than anything, especially if you're like me and are a huge nerd and like to just have random trivia knowledge, which is the average human has about 100,000 hairs on their scalp and blondes tend to have about 20% more hair follicles and redheads tend to have about 20% fewer number of hairs. Another hair fact I would love everyone to know is that the word alopecia just means abnormal hair loss. It is not a diagnosis of a specific type of hair loss. I say this mostly because I have patients regularly come into my office for a hair loss consult, meaning they're losing their hair and they go, please don't tell me that I have alopecia, but alopecia is just abnormal hair loss. It's something you already know that you have. And it is my job as the dermatologist to help you figure out what type of alopecia so we can make the correct interventions to correct it if possible. Next, I wanna tackle just a few facts about hair care in general. And the first one is that your hair will not get more oily if you wash it more frequently. I think a lot of people have this impression that if they space out their hair washes that their scalp magically won't produce as much oil and that is simply not the case. The amount of oil or sebum is what we call it in dermatology that your scalp naturally produces is completely independent of the amount of sebum that is already on your scalp. How much oil your scalp produces is really determined by your genetics and your hormones. So if you are someone who naturally produces more oil on their scalp and finds that their hair looks greasy after one to two days, it's completely fine to wash your hair every one to two days to remove some of that sebum from your scalp. But if you want to go longer in between washes, that's also completely fine, but know that that's not going to make you produce any less oil. Because hair oiliness varies so much from individual to individual, it also makes it very hard for dermatologists to make any specific recommendation on how frequently you should be washing your hair. I usually tell my patients, if your hair feels dirty or looks oily or smells bad, go ahead and wash your hair. You just have to be careful with how often you're styling it afterwards. So if every time you wash your hair, you're blow drying it and heat styling it, that's probably going to lead to more damage over time. But in that same token, if you are washing it every single day and being really kind to your hair and having gentle hair care practices, that really is not a problem at all. On the topic of hair washing, another kind of hair fact that's worth knowing is that both heat Heat and water exposure are both known to be damaging to the hair. However, everyone's hair is different. So how much water exposure one person's hair can sustain before becoming damaged or how much heat 
another person's hair can sustain before becoming damaged can really vary immensely. And so unfortunately, a lot of it comes to trial and error in terms of figuring out what works and what doesn't work for your hair. As general guidelines, I usually encourage my patients not to sleep with their hair wet and pulled back because that encourages the hair to stay wetter for longer, which encourages breakage and swelling of the hair, which makes it more easily damaged. The other thing is when you're heat styling your hair, trying to find the lowest effective temperature to achieve the aesthetic outcome that you want with your hair. But again, this is going to vary person to person. So if you sleep on your hair wet every night and you haven't noticed any increased breakage and you're happy with your hair, that's fine. Or if you heat style your hair every day and you're not noticing increased breakage and your hair is still shiny and lush and everything you want it to be, don't listen to me. Everyone's hair can tolerate a different number of insults and a different degree of insults. So if your hair is doing well and thriving with what you're currently doing, you don't have to change what you're doing. And my last two hair facts have to do with dandruff because this is something that I see every day on my patients during my skin exams and whether they bring it up or not, a lot of them have questions about it. So I thought I'd answer a couple here. The first is that dandruff is triggered by yeast on the scalp. So we all have yeast that naturally lives on our body. And in some people, they can get overgrowth of this yeast or their scalp can just be exquisitely sensitive to that yeast. And when that happens, that can cause irritation of the scalp and associated flaking. And the treatment of dandruff is often twofold. One is to reduce the amount of yeast on the scalp, but the other goal is to reduce the amount of oil on the scalp because oil feeds the yeast. This is why antifungal or anti-yeast shampoos are usually the first line treatment for dandruff because the shampoo itself reduces the oil on the scalp and then the anti-yeast ingredients of the shampoo reduce the amount of yeast that's triggering the dandruff. Which brings me to my final fact, at least of this video about hair, which is anti-dandruff shampoos are scalp treatments, not hair washes. So many people have tried and failed anti-dandruff shampoos. And a lot of that has to do with how they are using that shampoo. So you don't want to use it as traditional shampoo where you think about massaging it into your scalp and getting it all over your hair. Really you want to think about it as a scalp treatment and anti-dandruff shampoo should be focused exclusively at the roots and on the scalp. And then it should be allowed to sit for several minutes in order for it to exert all of its positive effects and anti-dandruff effects. For my patients with short hair, I'll often have them put their anti-dandruff shampoo in their scalp before they even get in the shower and sit for five minutes outside of the shower and then rinse off once they get in because that really ensures that that medication, which is what anti-dandruff shampoo really is, is sitting on their scalp long enough to be effective. Okay, that is my first round of hair and hair care facts. If you learned something new, put it in the comments below. And if there's more about hair that you want to know more about, tell me in the comments so that I can make videos that are helpful for you. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. Come follow me on Instagram at Dr. Samantha Ellis, and I'll catch you next time.